you would open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 24, go to verse 15. Let's just start there together. You can highlight, you can underline. It begins in the context of verse 3. Jesus at the Mount of Olives, the disciples coming to him privately. Tell us when will these things be, meaning the end of the world. What will be the signs of your coming and the end of the age? And this is how Jesus speaks about it in verse 15. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not take and bring back his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant, for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For there will be a great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anybody says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, don't believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead people astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you, Jesus says beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, don't go out there. And if they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, don't believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as, as it is to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Immediately, after the tribulation, hmm, of those days the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trump call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Lord Jesus, there are people that are watching this that are in desperate need of you. I'm not asking right now that you bless the Christian. I'm asking that you awaken the non-Christian. I'm asking, Heavenly Father, that you would begin to speak through the screen, the, the voice that some might hear, that they would miss the man, that they would hear you, and it might become meaningful to them because you created them for a purpose. The purpose is you. They were made for you. They were made by you. Everything about them says something about you. And I want to ask right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, that you would come and begin to awaken them to the fact that there is a God in heaven who calls them by name and who not only simply desires a purpose and meaning for their life, but has prepared for those who belong to you a place. And you will come back and take us to the place where you are, and that is heaven, home for the believer. I want everybody to be home where you are, Jesus. You give all of us a warning of things to come. You can't know the good news until you know the other side of the good news, and it's the bad news. There is a day when all of this will be done. And you are not simply a savior, but because you're holy, you're also a judge. Would you awaken? Would you inspire? Would you motivate? Would you change? Would you do something for the sake of eternity? Because you promised that your word would never return to you void. I thank you for that. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Jesus is going to come back. Now, some of you have listened to the message about the rapture. You say, what is the rapture, Pastor Dan? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you can go and read it for yourself. But on the continuum of church history, you have all of the prophets looking, and they're looking this direction, and they're saying there's going to come a day of a Messiah. There's going to come one who sacrifices once and for all. The Bible says of this Messiah, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So this Jesus whom the Bible is looking forward to in the prophets, is the one whom God laid the wrath of how he feels about sin on Jesus. So the Bible says that Jesus bore my sin and your sin on his body, on that tree which is the cross, so that you could die to your sin and live for righteousness, for by the stripes of Jesus you're healed. 
all of history in the Bible, from what we call the Old Testament, moving into the New Testament, is saying Jesus is going to change everything, and he does. The cross changes world history. When Jesus was born, we changed our calendar to a new day. When this began to happen, the Bible says not only did the cross happen, the resurrection of Jesus happened, showing that God received the sacrifice of Christ for the wrath that he had for men's sin, so that if you put your faith in Jesus, you're forgiven. Not only did the cross settle that and the resurrection show the evidence of God the Father's feeling about what happened, that Jesus is the Savior, but now the church age started. That happens in Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, there in verse 11, the disciples are going to be looking at Jesus as he begins to ascend into the clouds. <laughs> Their jaw's going to be dropped. They're going to be staring into heaven. And there's going to appear to them some angels. And the angels are going to say, why are you staring into heaven? This Jesus, the same Jesus who ascended, is going to come down in the way that he just ascended. And Jesus is going to speak about this in Matthew chapter 24. For as lightning comes from the east and, si and shines as far as it is to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Everybody's going to see him. The Bible says the most epic thing to ever happen in the history of the world is the second coming of Christ. Now, upon the church age, which is what you're in right now, you say, well, what's the church age? It's God's method of using the church to go and tell the whole world that you can be pardoned from your sin. It's the way that God shows his family like ambassadors to the world and says, I'm going to empower you in such a way that you go out and make disciples. You go out and talk about me, Jesus says. You go out and exalt me. You go out and make much of me. And as you do, baptize everybody who confesses me as Savior and Lord in the name of the Father, name of the Son, name of the Holy Spirit. That's the church age. Right now, you're living in a day and age where you have the right to go on behalf of God, empowered by God the Holy Spirit, and tell billions of people that there is a Savior who made you for himself and is calling you to him. That will not always be that way. The Bible says there's coming a day when God takes his bride, his church, and he moves them out of the world. When that day comes, that marks a seven-year period called the tribulation. Now, if you doubt that there's something of the great whoosh as it, earth, as it, as it is, the great rapture, then go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I can't read it for you now. You can go and listen to a message or two previous. But the Bible says that Jesus will come in the clouds. There will be a trump blast. There will be an archangel. There will be a command. And that command will be to all of his people, both living and to those who have previously died, but are known to be his they have his mark, they have his seal, they're robed in righteousness. The dead will rise in Christ, those who are living will be caught up with Jesus in the air, and we will be taken to the home that in John 14, 1, Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. You can imagine what that place is like. Good grief, if he creates the heavens and earth in six days, you can imagine what it's going to be like that he's had a couple thousand years in preparation of bringing his bride home to him. Everything about marriage speaks to him. Everything about the church speaks to him. Jesus is saying, I'm the groom. I'm coming for my bride. My bride is the church, and my bride's coming with me. That is the mark of the beginning of the end. So you can imagine the power of the moment when Jesus starts marching in, in a human body, with skin on, God moving into the neighborhood, speaking the language in the last few days of his life because God, according to Acts chapter 1, was going to take wicked men, use those wicked men to put Jesus to death as a sacrifice, and Jesus was willingly going to go as a lamb led to the slaughter, yet not opening up his mouth because of his great love for you and I and to bring glory and honor to his Father. And in so doing, in the last few days of his life, the disciples are saying, Jesus, what about the end of the world? Now, you've got to get the scene. Jesus is the only one. Even though he's told the disciples he must be put to death at the hands of wicked men, that knows he's going to go to the cross. The disciples clearly don't know. They don't understand. They've been told, but they can't grasp it because they're going to flee. 
They're all going to run. John will eventually come back to the cross with a few women. But all the disciples are going to abandon Jesus during his trials. And then Jesus, during the Via Della Rosa, will be hung a few feet on a garbage dump just outside the city. Jesus knows that this is to come. But he's sitting down and he's speaking so that those of us who have been called to be his people might know that we don't have to be afraid. That all of these things have already been positioned by him. So that when the day comes, you can watch the news and you can watch it with a great smile. You're not supposed to turn on CNN and Fox News and say, oh my gosh, look at all the terrible things that are happening. My world is falling apart. What are we going to do? You're supposed to say, Jesus already said these things must come like birth pains. Earthquakes are coming. Famines are coming. There's going to be brother between brother to death. There's going to be all sorts of trial and hardship before the coming of the Son of Man. And the reason that the second coming of Christ matters so much is because there must come a day where wrong is made right. There must come a day where the Bible declares, cannot the judge of all the earth not judge justly? He's going to judge justly. He's going to make it so that righteousness reigns. He's going to make it so that every king bows and every tongue confesses that the real king who reigns forevermore with all authority in heaven and earth has actually arrived. He will arrive, the Bible says, with great power and great glory. Now, I've got to tell you, the tribulation period is a period of time like the world has never seen. That's the declaration of Jesus. In verse 19 of chapter 24, he's going to say, this is a great day, a day of tribulation, a great tribulation, and this day must Come. Now, we're not quite talking yet about the second coming of Christ. The rapture has happened. Then there is an ushering period of trouble like the world has never known. That tribulation period is where God begins to say, you have a final act, a moment by which you can know you did not evolve, you were created. You are not going to live in nihilism, which means you cease to exist, but there is a judge, and that judge is on his way. It is a moment in time where the entire world begins to get the impetus that God himself is about to arrive. The second coming comes on the hills of the Great Tribulation. And the Bible has so much to say about this in Daniel, so much to say about this in First and Second Thessalonians, and a lot to say about this in Revelation. I want to encourage you that maybe some of these places are where you ought to go to do your homework. Now, there's so much to tell you. <laughs> I, would, I would love to give it all, but I can't. Right now, today, is just a description of what the Bible has to say, really, about the Antichrist who is to come, and then three sets of judgments listed out in Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 8, and Revelation chapter 16. They are the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. <laughs> you say, well, Pastor Dan, seals don't sound that bad. Trumpets don't sound any worse than bowls. I eat out of a bowl every morning. Thank you very much. Maybe every evening. I don't know. I don't know your dinner style. Maybe you like a bowl. Maybe bowls are how you eat. These bowls you don't want. By the time you get to Revelation chapter 16, God is firing them down in a, a hierarchy of movement where time is now constrained and he's giving everybody a moment by which they know that they're no longer in control. The one who made it all, period, on the end of the sentence. Now imagine it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says that there will be a mass evacuation of God's people. How many is that on planet Earth? We don't know. But the planes all of a sudden have no people but clothes on the seat. There's one walking, one is left, but the other is gone. Clothes are down. There's a mall and it's filled with people. There's highways and freeway systems. There's all sorts of corporations. And there are people that are taken out of those corporations. There's going to be chaos during that season by which the world has to explain what's happened, even though Jesus is already predicting the fact 
that as you watch the news, these things are growing closer and closer and closer so that you're to be watching and I'm to be watching and we're to be waiting for our heavenly home. And as that takes place, and the whoosh of God's people are taken out and God's wrath is prepared to fall down upon the world. The Bible says there's going to arise according to 1 Thessalonians, or rather 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, a man of lawlessness. That man of lawlessness described in the Bible is the Antichrist. Anti meaning instead of. He's known as Satan's Superman. Whereas God the Father sent God the Son, Lucifer is allowed and empowered to send his own anti. He's allowed to give his own false messiah. If you know anything about Satan, you know he counterfeits everything that God does. His greatest weapon is deception. It comes to steal, kill, and destroy. When he moves, he always moves in deceit. And his desire is worship. So what's he going to do? He's going to give one that he is going to empower. And in empowering him, the Antichrist is going to desire the worship of the world. When he shows up on the scene, according to Daniel and according to Revelation, he's going to show up as a man of peace. He's going to do something that nobody can do. He's going to bring peace to the Middle East. The Bible declares that as he's desiring to bring peace to the Middle East, all men are going to believe him. He will have a peace treaty signed in such a manner that those who have been at war all of a sudden hear, see, feel, think that just possibly the Messiah has arrived because nobody can bring peace like this man. In Revelation chapter 6, there is a, a rider on a horse. This rider on a horse is bearing a bow, but the bow has not yet been strung. Now this Antichrist is the rider with the bow who is yet to shoot the arrow, but the arrow will come next. The second seal that will be opened in Revelation chapter 6 is going to be war. So this peace will not last long. In the midst of the great whoosh of the rapture will come a man of lawlessness. This man of lawlessness will provide peace, but underneath this amazing oratory skill, underneath this amazing good-looking man will be who Lucifer really is, which is always deceit. He's worse than Hitler. Worse than Stalin. Worse than Saddam. He's a dictator like no dictator has ever been. And in the Bible, over and over, he is declared to not only be coming, but he is declared to have a nature of a beast. He is called the man of intrigue in Daniel chapter 8, verse 23. He is a fierce king in Daniel 8, 23. He is a despicable man in Daniel eleven twenty one. He is a man who brings destruction in 2 Thessalonians 2.3. He is a lawless one, as I've already spoken about, in 2 Thessalonians 2.8. He's an evil man in 2 Thessalonians 2.9. I've spoken about him being a beast. That is Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. He arrives out of nowhere, according to the Bible. In fact, if you go to Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. The sea is a picture of all of humanity. With all of humanity, there is one who begins to rise out of humanity. Right now, because I believe we're living in the last days by which the next thing to happen on human history is the rapture so that we get taken up to our heavenly home, God is preparing to say enough. Right now, this Luciferian Superman, this Antichrist that's going to arrive, the Bible says, from the Middle East, is going to be very possibly alive. He could be walking around right now. He could be learning right now, preparing right now. The Bible says, I saw one coming from the sea of humanity, and he begins to rise. He's going to be the mouthpiece, as it were. He's golden-tongued. You think you've heard great speakers? You think you've heard phenomenal orators? The Bible in Daniel chapter 7, 7 through 8, really through verse 25, Revelation 13 through 5, says that he's going to capture the world's attention. He's going to capture the world's attention in the midst of chaos. When chaos arrives and someone prepares and can bring peace, you want that person that can prepare, prepare and bring peace. And how is that peace? 2 Thessalonians 2, Daniel chapter 9, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It's a peace treaty. And he will be an orator that was prepared for many years. Not to do God's bidding, 
but to do Lucifer's bidding. Daniel chapter 4, Daniel chapter 7, he rises up out of Europe. Can you imagine? You won't see this. You won't be there. You'll be in your heavenly home. But this is the mark of the beginning of the end. He's striking and he's attractive. He's exactly who Lucifer would put out. While Jesus had no beauty by which men would be attracted to him, this man has striking beauty. Daniel chapter 7, verse 20, his appearance is greater than all of his other fellows. It's amazing that he looks beautiful, but in his soul is poison. He's boastful and proud against God. Revelation 13 through uh, 13, 5, he was given a mouth speaking great things, and he was blasphemous. Incredibly intelligent. Daniel chapter 7, verse 21. He has eyes like that of a man. It means that he sees what men cannot see because he is supernaturally empowered by Lucifer. You say, well, Pastor Dan, Lucifer cannot empower anybody. Yes, he can. Go to the book of Job. You will see that there is a supernatural power. And in this case, God allows Lucifer to employ it. And Lucifer will employ the power over his superman. He is irresistible and powerful. He was granted, the Bible says, power to give breath to this image, this image of the beast whom will boast and speak, whom will rise up against the saints and kill them. There will be a mark of this Antichrist whom the Bible calls a beast in Revelation chapter 13, 6. Now imagine it. As the world is in chaos and the Antichrist begins to take up his rightful place, as he now begins to say, I am the Messiah, you should worship me. As Jesus says, the abomination of desolation, meaning that the Antichrist is going to set up his rule in Jerusalem. He's going to take his place where Lucifer has always wanted to be and said, God, get off the throne. You get off the throne so I'm worthy of worship on the throne. And God said, I am the real king and banished Lucifer. And a third of heaven fell, the Bible said, so that now we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual forces of evil, rulers in the heavenly places. These are demons now banished from heaven, Lucifer being their leader, and this Antichrist being a superman. So where does Lucifer want to go? He wants to go to Jerusalem. He wants to go to Israel. He wants the worship where God alone is worthy of the worship. Jesus calls it the abomination of desolation. There Lucifer is going to set up his earthly throne through his superman. And this Antichrist is going to be such that he positions all of the world to have to have a mark. It's called the mark of the beast. Most of us know it as the number of man, 666. The Bible says to buy, to sell, to trade. You will have to have that mark. But if you're a believing Christian, the mark upon you will be the mark of the Lord Jesus Christ, robed in righteousness. The angels of heaven know it. All of, all of the saints uh, belonging to God know that mark. But you will not be able to take that mark of the beast. It will be a season of tribulation like those who are saints on earth. You say, how can there be saints on earth, Pastor Dan, if they were taken up to heaven? Because there will still be some who are repentant of their sin and through the great grace of God during the tribulation turn to the living God. They turn to Christ for the forgiveness of their sin. They're not free to take that mark. All of the world will buy and sell by the mark of this beast. 2 Thessalonians 2.9 says that this mark of the beast is because of this lawless one who is working out Satan's authority and power with signs and lying wonders. He actually is seeking to convince the whole world that he is the one who provides. He is the one who protects. That he is the Messiah. It's why the Bible calls him a false Messiah. That's what the number of the beast is about. You are fed by me. You are known by me. You are provided for by me. You are protected by me. What does Jesus, the good shepherd, say to his people? You are loved by me. You are fed by me. You are protected by me. You are provided for by me. Lucifer counterfeits Christ. As this lawless one takes up his reign, as he says there is to be peace, 
I looked and behold a white horse, Revelation chapter 6. Its rider had a bow. There was a crown given to him. He's a king. And he came out conquering with conquest. But it wasn't until verse 3, a second seal, that I heard the second living creature say, Come, and out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. Now, I'm not going to go through all of Revelation chapter 6. I'm going to let you do your homework. I've already preached on it. But for a moment, listen to the first set of the Bible says seals that are open. Those seals that are open are God's declaration that the end is upon all of the world. The seals, the trumpets, the bowls. And as they move in sequential order, they come faster and they come sharper and they come more deadly until one moment God says, and that's it. While all of these things begin to move from heaven, the Antichrist is standing up saying, don't worry about what's happening from heaven. Focus here on me. Bow down to me. Worship me. And where it starts out as peace, and Lucifer is always a counterfeit to Christ, and it always ends in death, that's what the movement is next, where his Palestinian, Israeli finding of let's come together and have a pact now turns into the beast rising up to bring war to the entire world. The first set of seals, while the Antichrist is moving and the seven-year period clock is ticking, war happens. From war, famine happens. From famine, death happens. And Hades comes forth. A third of the earth is killed with sword and famine and pestilence. And the animal kingdom is let loose on man. This is Revelation chapter 6. I'm not making it up. Some of you know if you've been to my house, I've got raccoons that are the size of Rottweilers and rats are the size of raccoons. I live in Narnia. I could not imagine if they were turned against me. But the entire animal kingdom is turned against. The voice of the martyrs and the seals will begin to cry out to God and say, How long, O Lord? We've been persecuted. We've been died and, 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 and experienced martyrdom and death for the sake of your name. And God will say, The end is yet to come. Be patient, and they'll be given white robes. There will be a great earthquake where the sun becomes black as sackcloth and the moon becomes like blood and the stars fall from the sky and the sky is now split apart and the mountains and the islands to an earthquake are moved from their place. You would think, wouldn't you, that that would be enough. That men would say, you know what? Things are going really wrong here. There must be one whom the textbooks don't give illustration to one whom I'm supposed to bend my knee to, that I was created from, that I go back to, that my life is held accountable before, but they won't. So God continues to throw down his wrath. It's not science fiction. The seventh seal leads to a first trumpet. Seven seals, seven trumpets, Seven bowls, six being the number of man, seven being the number of God, all through the Bible. God's saying, I see what you're doing. Now let me show you what I'm doing. Because I'm the final answer. Seven. And from the movement, seven trumpets begin to blast. Now the seven trumpets begin in verse 6. The Bible says, The first blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And they were thrown upon the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up. So everything that remains now has a third of it that no longer remains. A third of the trees were burned up. All the green grass was burned up. How do you think God feels about sin? How do you think God feels about unrighteousness? How do you think about a big eraser being pulled out that we say no to God and yes to us? God is answering. Verse 8, the second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain, like an asteroid burning with fire, was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. Can you imagine? The third of the sea no longer glimmers for those of you who love the ocean. Now it looks like and smells like blood. 
A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The world, as everybody knows it, has changed, and it's not a movie, it's real life. The third angel blew his trumpet, verse 10, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell to a third of the rivers and the springs of the waters. Every time man thinks he gets an answer, if a third of the water is now blood, let's go over to the fresh water. And then God supernaturally sends his answer over to the fresh water. So now the waters have become embittered. Verse 12, the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and the third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon and a third of the stars. Their light became darkened. A third of the day became darkened. And likewise, a third of the night darkened. And then I looked and I heard another angel. With a loud voice, it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth. Can you imagine this? Anytime you see something in the Bible and it says it three times, pay attention. Holy, holy, holy. God is saying, whoa, 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 disaster. Now it gets dark. The fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fall from heaven, given the key to the bottomless pit. This ought to cause the hairs on the back of your neck to stand up. He opened the door of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke, like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and their air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. And there the smoke came locusts of the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth, creatures that we haven't seen, living creatures that we don't know. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any great green plant or tree, but only the people that don't have the seal of God on their foreheads. Coming to Christ gives you a seal. Coming to Christ gives you a mark. Coming to Christ sets you apart from the world that the angels of God know it and the saints of God know it because the Spirit of God lives inside of them. Without that seal, you are now living apart from the righteousness of Christ. And in this case, there are beings created by which they are given permission to torment the people without the seal of Christ. Whereas death had happened, now God is going to remove death so that torment on earth can take place with no death at all. You want a taste of hell? God's beginning to give it to you. They were allowed to torment for five months, but not to kill. And their torment was like the sting of a scorpion who stings somebody. In other words, they're in agony. And in those days, people will seek death, but they'll not be able to find it. They will not be able to die, but death will flee from them. God says, so let me get this straight. You want to live without me. You're pushing hope away, life away, freedom away, love away. Then I will give you what it is you request. And the thing that you get when you request my absence is my wrath for how I feel against sin. So God opens up what man has never known, and he says, let me show you what happens apart from me. And God removes the opportunity to die. And there in appearance were creatures like no one had ever seen. But then there was a sixth angel that blew his trumpet. And there the six angels said, release the four angels who are bound in the great river Euphrates. These are demons. So these angels, these fallen angels, these demons, who had been prepared for this hour, this day, this month, this year, you think God's not sovereign? Were released to kill a third of mankind. And there, with sulfur on their heads, and horses like lions' heads, and fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. They created plagues, so that a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. You think that this isn't a supernatural world? You think God is not holding evil at bay? You think God hasn't set the times and the seasons for which He has said, I will show you who I am amidst 
your belief that you're really in control. But that's not the end. This is just the beginning of the end. As the mark of the beast continues to say bow, as the Antichrist has placed himself in Jerusalem, the armies of the world begin to rise up because they realize now that the Antichrist has positioned himself for worship so that even they have to bow and they want rulership of their countries. And pretty soon, surrounding this place in Jerusalem is going to come a 200 million man army. It's called Armageddon. And in Armageddon, the desire is going to be to wipe out Israel. It's even going to be to wipe out the Antichrist. It's going to be to rise up and say, we are in authority. And amidst the stars of the heavens and the suns and the moon and all the third of the rivers and all that happens in the ocean, these supernatural creatures, we still, because of our sin, will not acclaim of bending our knee before the Lord, but we're in authority. So God is going to bring an end. And that brings us to the bowls. The seventh trumpet will announce the beginning of the bowls. Just like the seven seals, the seventh announced the beginning of the trumpet. In Revelation chapter 16, a loud voice, verse 1, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. You don't want to be around for the wrath of God. So the angel poured out his bowl on the earth. Harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped this image. The second angel poured out his bowl, verse 3, and the sea now, it all became like the blood of a corpse. Every living thing died, not a third, everything that was in the sea. The third angel poured out his bowl, verse 4, the rivers and the springs of the water. They all became like blood. Now there's no fresh water. And I heard the angel in charge of the water say, Just are you, just are you, O Holy One, who is and who was and who brings these judgments. Who's bringing this? The Lord Almighty. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. The axis of the earth has changed. The orbiting of the earth around the sun has changed. The stars in the heavens have changed so that now the sun reaches out and scorches the very people who are on earth. There was fierce heat and they did not bow to Christ but they cursed the name of God, whom they knew had power over these plagues. They did not repent, and they did not give him glory. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne, and there the Antichrist and all of the kingdom by which he had established was plunged into darkness. Imagine the scene. There in Jerusalem where he's setting up his reign, now he can't even cause the sun to shine. It all becomes dark, and doesn't that remind you something of Pharaoh when God told Moses, go tell Pharaoh, you let my people go, and Pharaoh said, no, I'm the ruler, and God said, excuse me, no, Pharaoh, I'm the ruler. God now comes to the Antichrist empowered by Lucifer, says, excuse me, I've had enough of you thinking that you rule. Let me show the remaining of mankind along with all of heaven who's now gone to their heavenly home, whom the real ruler is, and darkness sets in. You ever been in darkness? Darkness is palpable. You can feel it. You can taste it. You can touch it. Go spelunking. That means cave exploring. Turn off your light. You will experience a darkness that comes down into your bones. It seeps over where the Antichrist has set up his rule so that people gnaw their tongues in anguish. They actually feel a presence in the darkness of torment. And they curse the God of heaven for their pains and their sores but still don't repent of their deeds. The sixth angel pours out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Now we prepare for World War III. Now we prepare for Armageddon. The Euphrates was dried up. And there the beast and the false prophet, unclean spirits, begin to surround them. And these demonic spirits 
now try to countermand what God is doing and perform signs to say, pay no attention to heaven, pay no attention to God, look at us. We are able to perform signs that no man can perform. We are whom you ought to worship. The Antichrist has laid his hand on another, and there, there is a sense of the Trinity, Lucifer, a Savior, and then one whom the Savior has put his hand upon. But that's not going to do it. Because in the midst of this preparation for battle, God says, that's enough. Friend, when the tribulation period begins, you'll be with Jesus in heaven. And when it begins, it's God saying like birth pains, it's time to have its conclusion. May God give us a great revival that many will be in heaven with him. Amen. Lord Jesus, bless your people watching. We want to go home. Thank you that this world is not our home. In Jesus' name.